go. Okay, so Max Weber. Um, this is uh, Max Weber's work was really what got me interested in sociology um, academically. So I, I love talking about Weber. Um, I think he's um, he's one of the more nuanced of all of the theorists. Marx and Durkheim both are very sure about themselves <laughs> and are very sure about their theories, whereas Marx tends or Weber tends to be um, very particular and says, my theories only work in certain times and in certain places. So he's he tries to be very contextual, whereas both Durkheim and Marx were trying to do grand theories to explain the entire way the world works at all times and in all places. Um, this will also be a kind of a stark difference between Marx, who when you start out learning about Marx, um, it seems very heavy and depressing and, you know, capitalism is destroying it. But once you learn about his, you know, the way he finds humans it, and his vision of how society is going to end, it's kind of lighter because he feels that there is a chance for utopia. He believes in humanity. Um, Weber is a little bit of the opposite. We're at, <laughs> at the beginning, he seems light. He's very um, open to like, here's how people are individual and have agency. Here's the way they act. Um, but by the end, we will see how he believes that um, modern society is, in his words, building an iron cage to trap us. <laughs> so um, a little bit different than Marx, who sees a utopia in our future. Weber um, is forecasting a... Um, a uh, Chains of drudgery, <laughs> so a little bit different there. So let's get started. Um, so Max and Marianne Weber, I wanted to make sure that we recognize Marianne. Max Weber couldn't be who he was without Marianne. She was also a sociologist. Um, she co-founded a bunch of societies. She brought women into the universities in Germany. Um, she was the first female representative of the government in Germany for her region, um, and she also received an honorary doctorate because as she worked with Max, she published a plethora of really incredible work on feminism and women in society. And so she is a sociologist in her own right. Um, I wish we had time to really engage with her stuff. One of the problems is it's really hard to find English translations because she isn't taken as seriously in um, American sociology. So that's part of the problem is I can't find like a good English translation of her work. Max, on the other hand, he started out as a lawyer um, and was big into socio social policy. So he's very active in society and in government. He actually started as a professor of economics, which is similar to, as, as we might recall, Marx was more of an economist when he started. Um, and then as he continued working, he decided my viewpoints are in sociology and he created the first German department of sociology. When we cover Durkheim, we'll see that Durkheim covered or started the first French department of sociology. And next week when we cover Du Bois, we'll see that Du Bois covered the first or started the first American department of sociology. So these are all firsts within sociology um, kind of so each one of them are creating their own version of how sociology should be. And for Weber, that's interpretivism. So um, it, this will, this is one of those broad, you know, Weber does more than just interpretivism, but this is just what we label his kind of sociology. And I think it's very interesting how he does it. And it will be a really good contrast once we focus on Durkheim. But a um, just kind of an overview um, so we haven't covered Durkheim yet, but I wanted to give just a little ex example of how he differs. So if, if you've read already um, the first, the introduction chapter we talk about, um, Weber focuses on possibility, on how humans have agency. We fundamentally change. We choose random things. And so there's always the possibility that an outcome could be different. Durkheim, on the other hand, is focusing on trying to find certain social laws that are universal and unchanging. Um, so there's a big difference between the way Weber sees sociology and the way Durkheim sees sociology. Um, Durkheim is trying to create a science that is 
exactly the same as physics, as chemistry, you know, biology, all the natural sciences. Um, so he tries to create, here's what we study, here are the methods we study with them, and it's the same as all the other sciences, it's just that we study social facts. Weber, on the other hand, says, no, <laughs> you can't study humans like you study geology. We are different kinds of beings, so we need new kinds of methods, and we need new kinds of theories about that. So that's why you'll see a little bit more complexity with Weber in terms of how he thinks about sociology, simply because he accepts the agency of humanity, and that morphs his sociology um, in a complex way. So an example of Weber's interpretivism and how it's particular and unique is when we discuss the spirit of capitalism, what he's trying to say is not that capitalism develops this way everywhere, but that in Western Europe, these are the factors that led to the rise of capitalism here. It's going to be different in Japan. It's going to be different in Africa. It's going, right. It's going to be different everywhere. But in Western Europe, these were the social um, structures and theories that led to capitalism's creation. OK. Um, and then I have an example here of Durkheim. We'll touch on this when we talk about Durkheim. But Durkheim had a very set idea of how modernity would come about. And so he said, all societies start as organic societies and all societies will end in mechanical so societies. So like he was very, he was trying to, again to create these universal mechanisms that every place would cover, which I think we all can today say, well, that's a little, yeah, you know. So let's get into how did Dirk, or how did Weber then do sociology? So I want to start at social action and, and the way Durkheim conceives of social action determines how he does sociology. And so we'll get numbers three through five are his how he does sociology, whereas one and two are his visions of the social world. So first, social action, as you read, is a meaningful action oriented to others and that carries an individual's reflexive or interpretive aspect. So there's two parts to the um, social action that we need to focus on here. The first is that it's always an action oriented towards others. Um, me drinking water is not a social action because I'm not doing it with or about or for other people unless we are at a table with other people and I'm like, you know, I'm very focused on how I drink water because I want to see prim and proper. Then suddenly this is a social action because it's oriented towards others in the space. But if I'm just at home lazing about drinking water, not a social action. Second part of social action is that there is meaning and interpretation into our action. We do not just, what Weber is saying is we do not just act, but we have meaning and purpose behind our actions. And we think about the way we act. So we're reflexive on it and making sure that our actions have that the meaning we wanted them to have. So um, it, it makes sense if we think about this in terms of, let's say I love my partner and I want to give him flowers. If there was no meaning behind social action, giving him flowers would be strange, right? He's a lawyer. What would he do with flowers, right? It, it doesn't make sense for me to give him flowers unless there's that social meaning behind it that he recognizes, oh, this is something that I um, am giving out of demonstrating love or care or thanks or whatever it is. So that's every action that is social has some kind of meaning behind it that the sociologist's job is then to understand and to get at. Okay. So that, that's his basis. That's like the, that's where Durkheim start or Weber starts is at the social action. We see that for Marx, he actually started far more individual with humanity's essence is to create productively, right? But Weber is starting right here of when do humans start interacting? That's what he's concerned about. Not so much of like, what is the human essence? So, Professor. Yeah, go for it. 
that that is what confuses me actually about Marx because the way that I read him, I kept thinking he was talking to individuals and but but not really. You know, it, it was kind of confusing uh, to me because that's why when I if I thought of Marx talking to me as an individual, I can understand Weber, right? Because of that. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but I can. I, I understand Weber because of the way that I perceived Marx saying that how I act in this capitalist way in my individual way. Right. Uh, that's why I was always confused by him because I might do something entirely different than his theory said. And that is what was throwing me off. Right. And so, uh, um, so Marx has a very general idea of, so what human essence is, but then he wants to explain how macro um, material structures. So remember, this was the mode of production. So capitalism, right. feudalism how that influences how people act and how they behave. And when he starts with that analysis from the macro to the micro, he's really looking at how economics influences the masses, right? So even though individually our human essence is to be creative producers, when he's looking at how does capitalism affect us, it's more of how does capitalism affect the working class writ large? rather than how does capitalism affect each individual worker? Does that make sense? Yes. So, well, he does have some elements, and Brittany and I were talking about this before you jumped on, like um, when he talks about alienation of um, humans to humans. So he does get mm -hmm. into a little bit of how capitalism affects us on a micro scale, right? I, um, If capitalism changes how we interact, because now it's all based on um capital like are you are a form of capital i am a form of capital are you useful to me in my production of goods or in my own survival um so he does get into it a little bit um but you might already be saying that's not how i think about people right i don't see other people as another resource for capitalism um and that's why mm -hmm. it makes more sense on a macro scale where we can see how in total, a lot of people do treat each other as, you know, are you valuable for me economically? And then that mm -hmm. might. So I, that's how I would try to think about Marx is he's really looking at masses. Um, and okay. I, does that help a little bit? Yes. OK, thank you. So um, Weber very much is honing in first. He really wants to look at those like the actions between individuals and then how we envision society like going from that little small part to society is point number two. So regularities of social action. So when we imbue an action with meaning, we need to have in order for that action to have relevance to the other party. They need to have a similar meaning, right? So even if I feel that flowers are a demonstration of my gratitude, but my partner thinks that they are a worthless, like a worthless purchase, uh, when I give the flowers to him, there's a disconnect in our social action, right? He might see this as useless, whereas I'm trying to show love. And so there's like a rupture there. So what Weber says we should focus on is when social action is in sync. When do we repeat actions and when do those actions share the same meaning? So in the book, I think I'm pretty sure this is a direct quote. Actions are repeated by the actor or simultaneous, simultaneously by multiple actors because the subjective meaning is generally meant to be the same. So. Another example of this might be um, when you're in a full classroom, everyone's taking notes during a lecture, 
That's a regular social action because each one of those people has a similar meaning to I need to take notes so I can do well on the test, right? So they are all, it's not that one person's taking notes because they love taking notes and then one person's taking notes because they want to be on the test. There's a generally shared meaning between social action. So this is, it's... Professor. Yeah, go for it. Is voting, would voting be considered that? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. So um, we can think of just any regular action that people do. So driving on the right side of the road, um, giving chocolates on Valentine's Day. Um, I'm trying to just pull out random things. Giving a teacher an apple. Um, so all of these like kind of cliche actions are great examples of a regular social action. Um Telling your, like, we see the way that parents, you know, say, um, good boy or good girl, right? That's another regular social action. So, the, and he is going to say it's not regular in all places and in all times. And even a human who might have, um, who might do an action twice, they might have a different meaning each time. And we can think about, like, irony or you know, sarcasm that I might say to my son, I might at one time be like, oh, good job, because he did a really good job. And then at another time be like, oh, good job, because I'm making fun of him, you know, tripping and falling on his face. So like um, even a singular person can have different meanings for the same action. But what he's saying is generally we are going to look at general regularities of social action. So. That's his view, his basic view of the social world. And we'll add complex layers to it as we go. But I wanted to, that's where we want to start is first, when we act to, when our social action is a action with meaning that is oriented to another. And what sociologists should focus on is when those meanings are shared and that action becomes regular and um, continues on. So... The next three things are how does a sociologist then evaluate social action? First is by ideal types. So these are just tools and models. Similarly, like remember how I said that Weber, um, because so the social world is different than the material world, we need different tools than the material the physical scientists use. This is one of the social, to the sociologist tools that is unique to sociology. So ideal types are conceptual models that you categorize the regularities of social action. And then you use those as a framework by which to judge and classify the reality of social actions. So we um, will get into this in a second of the, his, his ideal types of social action and then we'll find that none of these really like no one just has those four types or no one actually embodies one of those types and he even says it is rare that an ideal type is found in the real world we just use these categories to like make sense of the world right we're just using some kind of like classification system so that we can make sense of things um one, it, we could think about this, you know how, um, if you've ever studied biology, um, they change the classifications of animals fairly often. I mean, not all of them, but like they'll find a new animal that kind of disrupts their understanding of what it means to be a mammal. And so they'll have to reclassify it. That's something similar is that they've created categories of animals and they're trying to make, you know, they're trying to fit the categories that, or match the categories to the real world, but there's often disruptions. Um, for Weber, most of the times there's disruptions. We're just using it to kind of get a sense of how the social world works. So the second thing that sociologists do is locate. So locating. It's the process of contextualizing and he uses the word crystallized, partly because Durkheim uses crystallization. Um, but he's talking about regularized social action. So something when something is crystallized, that means it's become, re, it's become formal, it's become um, structured. 
is what he means by crystallization. So crystallized social action is another way of saying regularities of social action. So locating is the process of contextualizing the social action and relationships on a comparative historical scale. So saying, what are the ideal types in American society in 2022, right? So he wants both in terms of space, so where is this happening, and in terms of time, when is this happening? So we need to locate why is a particular social action becoming regularized in this geographic area and in this time period? That's one. Of, that's a way. That's one of the things that sociologists need to do to understand social action. And then finally is social domains. So social domains are a realm or sphere of life in which action becomes regularized and social rather than random or reactive. So a um, these are sim uh, we haven't talked about there are so many comparisons with Durkheim I want to make but we haven't talked about Durkheim yet. Um, so a realm or a sphere of life is something like um, large systems or communities. So we're thinking like the religious sphere of life. We're thinking the economic sphere of life, political sphere of life, um, social sphere of life, right? Um, and so it's in these spheres of life that we learn our meaning that we, we, we learn how action has meaning. So I didn't just come up with the fact that flowers show love, right? I had to learn that, whether it was from my family, whether it was from the movies, whether it was, you know, because, you know, every time I go to a store on Valentine's Day, they're like, buy these roses. Um, so I had to develop the idea of the meaning somewhere, and that happens within the social domain. So remember... Weber is saying we need to identify the social domain that regularizes the action. So let's say an example of a, uh, another example of a regular social action would be, um, uh, here's one, um, uh, singing the national anthem at sports games. Um, Intuit, like the, the average American just might think that is a great thing that we've done forever. However, Weber would say, well, what is the meaning behind this? Why did it start happening? When did it start happening and where? And what is the realm of life and why? And when he investigates that, he'll see that there was actually like the military was losing a lot of um, recruits. And so they actually paid a lot of money into the NFL and to the NBA to request more militaristic displays of patriotism as a way for recruitment, right? So this would be, he was, he's contextualizing this display and the meaning, even though the, like, the construction of that meaning is a little bit obscured from the public view. And today we just look at it as like, well, of course you have to stand for the national anthem, Otherwise, you're a terrible person, um, whereas it's a very contextual and actually constructed way of, you know, going to sports matches. And so very few people can understand, like, and maybe it's, I should say, very few younger people can imagine a sports game without the national anthem. But that's not always been the way it's been. Okay, so that's what he, he's, he'll try to locate the social action within the social domain um, and on the historical and comparative scale. Does this make so, sense of how he's going about it? So, Professor, I have a question. Yeah. So, so now, <clears throat> if I think about it that way, um, okay, so I'm going back to Marx again for a second, but Marx talked about the this proletariat revolution that would be coming along right that that he expects will happen uh at some point in time um and it sounds to me the way that i'm understanding weber is he is also saying that things are are 
are particular to his to a particular his or particular space in time, mm-hmm. and that they can change. So, like, like what you were just talking about a moment ago with the uh, anthem at sports uh, arenas, the the pushback from Black Lives Matter seems to change that a little bit in my mind, mm-hmm. uh, right? But it's for this time. Right. It, it might not have been, you know, maybe 10 years ago, but for this time, maybe we don't all socially uh, put our arms over our chest anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and understanding so this the way you're saying that yeah and so he'll be looking for okay so what are the so he'll, again he'll be trying to locate the the meaning and the and the um process behind your um or i, I shouldn't assume behind people who support black lives matters um rejection of that norm right so why are suddenly in 2018, I think that was when Kaepernick started kneeling. Why in 2018 mm-hmm. are um, a group of, you know, African-Americans not following this regular social action? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, he, and that's what Weber would be studying. Right. He would be studying that. Okay. Right. And and Marx was less... Um, see, so Marx wasn't giving us necessarily a way to study the world. He was more telling us the way the world works, right? He was trying to say, here's okay. how the world works. Let me tell you how it works. And here's what's going to happen. Whereas Weber is saying sociologists are going to always be learning because history is evolving. History is changing. And so we're always going to need sociologists to create ideal types, reform ideal types, locate action, understand meaning and explain the social domains in which action is taking place. Does that make sense? The okay. Difference between the two. It, yes, it okay. does. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So let's give an example of, or let's dive into what he means by the types of social action. So there's four types that he um, discusses. The On the left, we have rational types. And on the right, we have irrational types. And we'll get into um, how... This distinction between rational and irrational is actually fairly important. Um, And rational um, is simply a rational. So by rational, he means that they are thinking about it, that they are reflecting on it and that they understand they're actively choosing the meaning or the purpose of the action. Um, And so and rational is a rational choice action in which someone's engaging in social action for the purpose of some end. They want something out of it that is separate from the action itself, right? I go to work so I can get money. Value rational is a rational choice action in which a person engages in social action because of the value of the action itself. I go to work because I love what I do. Um, Irrational is meaning they do it reflexively or without thinking. So there's two types, the emotional or effectual. This is someone who acts out of some kind of emotion, whether it's anger or joy, love, whatever. And then traditional is just habitual action. So this is something that, um, like uh, language, we don't think about often what we say. It's just the words come out of our mouth. Um, We might think about social norms, often like, why did you wear clothes today? You probably didn't wake up and debate within yourself, should I wear clothes or not? You probably just started putting on clothes. Maybe you debated what kind of clothes, but the, the choice to wear clothes probably wasn't a rational like debate within your mind. Um, so that would be a habitual action. And we could do this, we could explain the same kind of action with all of these different meanings behind it. So let's take the example of um, soccer. So we could play soccer for each of these different um, types of social action. So like, remember that what's important for Weber is the motivation or the uh, meaning behind action. So if we were playing soccer with, if it was an end rational action, perhaps that's because we want the prestige, we want the trophy, we want to win, you know, Uh, We want the medal. 
If we're doing it for value rational action, perhaps it's just because we enjoy playing soccer, right? We really love the game. We're in it. Um, if it's emotional, maybe when I get mad, I just need to like get my anger out on the pitch. So I'm going to go play soccer to like, you know, um, and tradi habit is perhaps I've been playing soccer for eight years. Um, I've been training for eight years and every morning I just get up at six and I start playing. Or you could think about, you know, how athletes often practice so much so that when they're playing, they instinctively act, right? Oh, he's doing this, so I need to do that, right? That instead of like having to write reason through everything. So the same act of playing soccer can have multiple different motivations and thus would fit in different types of social action. Now, remember when I said Weber doesn't feel like any of these act rare, rarely do any one ideal type actually occur in reality. Um, so rarely would someone playing soccer only have end rational motivations, right? Um, it would be hard for me to imagine, you know, someone like Messi or Ronaldo who does not love soccer, but also does not want the trophy, you know? <laughs> so they mm -hmm. both have an end rational meaning and a value rational meaning. While they're playing soccer, they're also acting habitually because they've practiced so much, they just kind of move through it. And you see it all the time when people are playing soccer that they get so frustrated that they like, you know, knock someone over or they slide tackle someone. So they even have a emotional irrational action during that moment. So, um, what what he's what he's doing with the ideal types is just giving us categories to think about it and then we can notice patterns right maybe this kind of country you know maybe we see the germans um having more end rational soccer players that are more oriented in that direction whereas um i don't know the canadians are more habitual or you know so He's using these categories to help us then make comparisons and help us figure out the location. Remember, he wants us to locate and he wants us to find the social domains. So these are the um, this is how ideal types. It's really just to help us get, you know, an orientation and a, a, an easy way to compare and talk with other sociologists about social action. Are there any questions on ideal types then? Professor, why are traditional habits or traditional things seen as irrational if I'm understanding irrational the way that I'm understanding it? So irrational, when I hear. Go for, so do you like irrational as like a negative thing? It's like. Yes. And I think I'm thinking about it the wrong way. Yeah. So the way that Maybe. I. I I couldn't find the quote I wanted to about how Weber defines rationality, but rationality for Weber just means deliberately thought about. And so irrational is something that you did not consciously go through a decision-making process. So, okay. so it's not that you're like, oh, she's irrational, right? Like she, you know, like that kind yeah. of phrase. It's not that. Yeah. It's, it's an action that someone did either out of habit or out of emotion. So it just didn't require thought just because exactly. it's so innate in exactly. you or, or mm -hmm. what have you. Exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's so he's not putting a value on this. He's not saying irrational action is bad. He will say, and we'll see this as we go on. He believes that society is moving towards more, that more people are engaged in rational actions um, and less in irrational actions that the nature of society is changing to encourage and enforce more kinds of rational actions. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Um, these are the actual definitions that I pulled out for ideal types. Um, we're not going to go into it. Um, I'm posting this online so you can see it there. Um, so when we use ideal types, what we've been talking about now are more like individual or interpersonal ideal types, so like the micro level. Let's move into how Weber can use ideal types to talk about macro issues or meso level issues. And this we do with questions of domination and power. So 
You might see in some texts they talk about authority and in some texts domination. Depending on the translation, those are used interchangeably. So when you see domination or authority, they mean the same thing. So domination in uh, Kahlberg, when he translates it, he translates it with domination, is the likelihood that a, a certain command will find obedience among a cer specific circle of persons. That is a complicated way of saying it is the likelihood that a people will follow a command <laughs> right, from another person. Um, so domination is a type of power. Power 